reality itself is beyond our ideas of it. It's non-conceptual. It's just, it's just like, it is exactly what it is. If you don't compare things and instead you say like, okay, you point to a random tree and you're like, how good an example of that tree is that tree? And you have to be like, oh, it's, it's perfect. It's beyond perfect. It's, that's the best version of that tree <laughs> being that tree that you could ever imagine. <laughs> there, there couldn't be a tree in the world that would be a better version of that tree. No matter how damaged it is, no matter, you know, what's going on with it. It's just, it, it's, you can't even put it into words. It's so superlatively above perfect because <laughs> it's, <Yeah. laughs> so that's the feeling is everything is like that. Every, the whole universe is singing out with this, like, I am myself. And like, if you just don't compare and be like, oh, well, I like, th I like that tree more than that tree. <laughs> like that's the bondage of suffering comparison and thinking that's real. First of all, for anyone tuning in, Dr. James Cook has been on the podcast before. I think it was episode six. I'm not 100% sure, but we were in the single digits back when this journey started. I saw one of your videos pop up the other day and I said, wait a second, maybe I should hit him up again and see if we can go over our journey and exploration of the mind over these past years. So um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on here and touching base with me and all the listeners. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's great, great to be back with you. As I say, I've been, um, I mean, YouTube keeps serving me up your your content over the years, uh, <laughs> and having some great guests on. So uh, we're definitely still in the same kind of stream, for sure. So, yeah, for anyone that uh, doesn't know who you are, <clears throat> excuse me, how would you explain what your work is, what Inner Space Institute is, and anything else about yourself you want to get into? Yeah, good place to start. So. Um, yeah, who I am effectively is is someone who had an awakening as a teenager and then was interested in science and so studied neuroscience, studied the mind scientifically, and then came to a place where I felt like I could spend the rest of my life in academia just playing with ideas, but the spirituality stuff, the awakening stuff is, is you know, it's deeper than ideas and it feels a lot more meaningful, a lot more aligned with what's most foundational in reality and helping people and relieving suffering, that kind of stuff. So I transitioned out of academia uh, a couple of years ago now to focus on kind of public communication, you know, stuff facing uh, general people instead of just talking to other academics. And um, yeah, my hope is to kind of communicate that spirituality awakening, this stuff isn't, um, I think a lot of scientific people just assume it's, they just dismiss it. And I think then, you know, so if they don't want to engage in that terrain, I think the gut instinct to dismiss it comes first. And then there's some like, oh, well, maybe they're just making stuff up or whatever, like people say about, about this stuff if they're not into it. But for me, the, um, because the awakening happened first and it felt so much like contacting kind of base level reality, <laughs> um, I came away from it being like, I think if you have that kind of experience as an adult, perhaps you think, wow, this is so altered that it feels supernatural. It feels magical. It feels mystical, all this kind of stuff. But it, because it happened at an early age for me, I was just like, well, this is the real thing. Like the way we usually live is the delusion. <laughs> like this is, yeah. this is super, and a lot of people have that insight. So I'm very passionate about explaining why, how that is, how it is that the mind distorts at the appearance of reality and that science is increasingly just what we're discovering about the mind and about real, you know, physics and stuff just fits with this picture of, um, of reality that people come to through, you know, spirituality, through studying their own minds. So I, I, in my academic work, I hit on what I see as a solution to, um, a place of consciousness in, in, in our universe. And I think I, that was possible because I had this awakening kind of perspective where I, I saw certain things that other people took as granted, such as the existence of the self, as I saw them as delusions rather than things that are actually really solid and real. Um, so we can get into the details of that. But, and then alongside that, so I've got this book coming out called Dawn of Mind in December. And um, the book's coming out in December. It's called The Dawn of Mind. It's not called The Dawn of Mind in December. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then uh, that explains at kind of intellectual level, this picture of where I think consciousness fits into reality and how science and spirituality go together. And then I've launched innerspaceinstitute.org, which is kind of like a meditation app in a website. Um, I might make an app version later, but it's effectively experiential practices to guide people into non-duality, awakening, all this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, those, those are the main things I'm, my offerings at the moment. 
Nice. Oh, I'd have a podcast called Looking Mirrors, <laughs> which I've been doing for a few years. Yes. Yeah. So I want to get into this initial awakening. You know, you're seeing your self-realization, you could say, at a young age. How did this come about and how would you even describe what you saw in yeah. the world or yourself, you know? Yeah, I think I, I think the thing that alienates a lot of people about awakening is that it is the falling away of ideas, of concepts, of of the ability to describe really and to frame and limit your perception of reality. So it, it is inherently un, indescribable, but I will go on to you know, do my best. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, and it, but it's best to describe it in those negative terms, like so, yeah, a state of no no bounds, no no of kind of boundlessness, you could say. Um, so I'll tell the whole story. So. I was about 13. I was raised in a Catholic family. I was overly conscientious as a kid. I was on a bus ride. Um, and I was really upset and stressed out about the concept of going to hell because I didn't have blind faith. And I, again, I, as a kind of conscientious kid, I just wanted to have blind faith and just give in and be like, yep, like the authoritarian God, if he exists, like, fine, I'll have blind faith and just don't <laughs> punish me for infinity. Mm -hmm. Um, but no matter where I looked in my experience, I just couldn't find it. I just had this, it just felt like the way my mind worked was like, I won't, I don't believe things for no reason. Like, I'm not just yeah. going to believe, you know, like, what's that flying spaghetti monster thing that was it Dawkins yeah. spoke about? Like, yeah. um, I'm not just going to believe random things for literally no reason. Um, so anyway, so, but I wanted to, and I was like, okay, so this God's created me this way and he's going to punish me forever, even though he created me without the blind faith and he's supposedly benevolent. Uh, but like, so I just I kept going around this. I just couldn't. And it, so I think it functioned a bit like a koan in, uh, in Zen Buddhism, where there's just, there is no answer. There is no satisfying conclusion to that logic at the level of the mind. If you passionately are invested in it, the mind, the mind will just chew on that and hit a dead end. And that's effectively what happened. I think the, the thought paradigm, the paradigm of, of, of bondage in suffering of, of the human mind, which, you know, so effectively I think the mind creates fixed categorical ideas of what's going on in the world and it's very attached to them being real. And so we, we get stuck in this bondage of thought and effectively it just, there was a glitch for a second. It kind of stopped, got disrupted. And then what happened was experientially, there was just a collapsing into freedom. You could say like, if it, what it felt like is that freedom, boundlessness is the only thing that exists. And it takes the form of this illusion of contracted, uh, conceptual, um, perceiving of reality, but really everything is playing out in, in freedom in boundlessness. And so it was a state of complete liberation from the thought paradigm. And I just felt overjoyed. Um, it was like, there was no separation between me and reality and reality was just kind of blossoming forth. Uh, I was completely intimate with it. Complete it was just the most enjoyable, satisfying, fulfilling sense of, of wholeness and no time, no space, just I could still function and get around in the world. But yeah, it felt like I discovered that we've always been in the Garden of Eden and that, we, that we've had you know, the veil of Maya kind of <laughs> you know, over our, to mix religious metaphors, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, obscuring it. And it's, it's, it's all around, it's everything. Um, so what that left me with was an understanding that reality itself is beyond our ideas of it. It's non-conceptual. It's just, it's just like it is exactly what it is. It is. Um, and everything, everything, if you... If you don't pick, if you don't compare things and instead you say like, okay, my, uh, you, you point to a random tree and you're like, how good an example of that tree is that tree? And you have to be like, oh, it's, it's perfect. It's beyond perfect. It's that's the best version of that tree being that tree that you could ever imagine. Like there, there couldn't be a tree in the world that would be a better version of that tree, no matter how damaged it is, no matter, you know, what's going on with it. It's just like, it's, you can't even put it into words. It's so superlatively above perfect because <laughs> it's yeah. <laughs> so that's the feeling is everything is like that. Every, the whole universe is singing out with this, like I am myself. And like, if you just don't compare and be like, Oh, well, I like that. I like that tree more than that tree. <laughs> like that's the bondage of suffering comparison and thinking that's real. Um, anyway, so went on to study the mind. Um, Oh no. Well, I, the, you're asking about the awakening thing and now I'm going to go in a loop now. I just keep telling my story. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll let you take it. Good. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you said a lot of truth in that it's all perfect. As Neem Karoli Baba would say, it's all perfect. Ramdas, don't you see? <laughs> it's very true. And it's, 
it's almost like too easy to see. We glean yeah, over it. Too like simple. The truth, yeah. yeah, it's too simple. The truth is hidden in plain sight, but nevertheless, it is the truth. It's all perfect. Now, how do you suppose we uh, are able to actually see this realistically? Do you recommend like a self inquiry? It seems like you had a very intensive right. self inquiry practice. Yeah, I think that's effectively what was happening. Yeah, so um, yeah, and it, it's worth saying most people in the audience probably are familiar with what we're talking about here. But we're talking here yeah. about the kind of absolute nature of things. So, um, but some people can understandably get a bit kind of uh, activated by the idea that on the relative level, it absolutely makes sense to say to have your preferences and to say I prefer I prefer um, flourishing over suffering. I'm moved by compassion, you know, by other people suffering. So there is. You can perceive imperfection on a relative level, but it, it doesn't mean that it's truly there on, a, on an foundational level. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, I think what effectively happened to me was a, I think koan practice in Zen, where you have these, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping, that kind of thing, um, and self inquiry, where you say like, who am I, or like you look for the one who's looking. I think those are, I think those work the same way as the, if you want to call it a method, the kind of theological inquiry I was doing as a teenager. Um, because it, if you're really, you don't just do it casually and go, oh, like, who am I? And then go, well, oh, don't know, and then move on. <laughs> with those with those practices, you are, for them to work, you need to pour all of your passion, like you need to really want it. You need to want to penetrate delusion and really have this drive to see truth, um, experiential truth. There isn't some final, you know, truth that can be put into words, but you know, to penetrate delusion. Um, and I think that's kind of what was happening there in a sense. Uh, so yeah, I, the way that I uh, kind of teach this stuff is to approach awakening. Well, so I should say there is, a, you kind of approach this stuff gradually where the fundamental bondage of the mind is, as I said, like you could say reified ideas, ideas about the way things are that we, we're really invested in. We have, we have attachments around them. Like if you think you are a thing, a solid thing that exists over time that will die, you can be really concerned about your death because it feels like your death is a real thing. And then you deconstruct that and actually you see there is no actual thing here inside this body that exists over time. And and even if there was, like that thing won't experience its own death because it will be the absence of experience. And so you can you can start to deconstruct it and see there actually isn't a problem here with my own death. Like uh, So that's a good example of the kind of process. And if you take that process through, you know, a superficial example would be if you're a gardener and you're bothered by weeds in your garden, and then someone says, "Oh, you know, actually, in my country, that weed is considered a beautiful plant." Suddenly, like that could pop. You, you thought that genuinely was a weed; it had essence of weed in it. And now you go, "Oh, yeah, a weed is a is a convention. It's a way of talking, a way of looking at things." And then suddenly, that could give you experiential freedom. You realize that isn't really a weed. It, a weed is an idea that you're projecting onto onto reality, and so basically everything is like that the self the distinction between self and world space uh, time all of these things are ideas that are imbued with this sense of reality through our attachment to them being real so the path is really one of seeing through that again and again and again and grounding in direct non-conceptual experience just raw color sounds you know in the senses the sound of thought um and that takes you out of the illusory kind of the delusion of this idea space into what's really present, which is experience. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you can approach this continuously, but the awakening, what we're really talking about is you can, you can go and strip back and maybe gain more freedom with the weed example and other examples, but then you hit a point where the fundamental bondage is, is the one you're seeing from, is the bondage of self, is thinking there's some division between self and world. And that's where things start to get freaky for people. Because <laughs> if, if you're just talking about like working with your beliefs, like people can be like, all right, fine, I can keep this at some arm's length from who I feel myself and myself to be. But when you start to really try to uproot yourself, like that gets a bit weird. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so that's why self-inquiry is like, uh, so, so you can approach this with meditation and for some people that's good enough and they will uproot this gradually. You can approach it through self-inquiry, which is to go, okay, I'm really just going to go for the root issue here and try and see through this this delusion um and then the third option if those aren't working for whatever reason i think is kind of more emotion work like like integration of the mind integrating the shadow uh so i think those three paths really help and you can do all of them you can converge you know different ones but the uh, the inquiry runs interesting and i think particularly effective for people um and a way of thinking about it is 
so we have these mental ideas about how things are that we're attached to, but they're not really, the world isn't actually uh, constricted in any way. It just feels like it is. Like when you're bothered by that weed, nothing's changed in reality. It's just you're behaving in such a way that you feel the pain, you feel the suffering. So it's a bit like um, an analogy that came to mind a few days ago was if you've got a mime who's acting out that he's in a glass box and he's acting out that the box is shrinking, and then he gets amnesia and he forgets that he's acting, but he keeps the performance going and then the box is constricting around him and he starts to really get freaked out and he thinks he's going to die and he's like really uncomfortable inside this tiny box. But remember, there's there's no box there, but he's just really in the performance of it. Um, and then the person next to him who's seen through the illusion of the box is just like, you know, there's actually no box there. And then they would they would understandably be pissed off. They'd be like, functionally there is. Like, I'm even if they understood intellectually, They'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm still suffering. And, and you have sympathy. They are genuinely suffering. But then I think the way inquiry works or what happened with me with the awakening is there's some moment of a glitch where you stop the performance. And so it's a bit like, you know, if a fire alarm goes off and the mime just reflexively stands up, looks and says, like, oh, do we have to like get out of here? And then it's like, oh no, false alarm. All right. He turns back and then suddenly he's dropped the performance. And before he even knows it, he's just one, he's just completely free. <laughs> he's just mm -hmm. like the bondage is just, it was never there. And he's like, holy crap, like, I didn't even have to do anything. I just had to stop doing the performance. <laughs> so that's kind of what these practices do is they, they create that disruption and you fall, I mean, you don't even fall back. There's just, it just becomes, you become the awakening, you become freedom and freedom is just suddenly the case. And it's, it's a, it's an amazing joke, you know, played on yourself like, to discover that you are your own bondage. Even the yeah. sense of being a self is this idea that constricts us. And it's obviously frustrating for people as well, because it's not funny until it is funny, <laughs> but when it, when you see <laughs> it's not it, funny it's until it is funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's part of the joke. Yeah. It's a grand cosmic joke that we seem to be playing on ourselves. It's yep. true. I'm going to bounce off your mime analogy. I like that a lot. <laughs> Do you say that even though we realize that we have been playing the mime our whole life, we realize the self-constructed box, that in some way we come back into the performance, as in before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry yeah, yeah. water? Like, right, do you, right. Oh, go ahead. I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an excellent uh, thing to go to. So... um yeah, so most of this path is, as a point to deconstructing that, though, looking into those attachments that you you can say, so you can look into the ideas, like how is it that I'm perceiving a weed as not as separate to a weed? And that's just like looking at experience for divisions and separations. Um, but then you also, the, there's the emotion side of like, where are my attachments here? Um, why do I care so much about this being a weed? And, you know, I'm using a trivial example, but this goes all the way to our most deeply held, um, deeply held concerns. And so as you're doing that, you're really, you're really dismantling your sense of self, your sense of reality. There's a, a lot of letting go. Um, I think grief can be a really, like I, for me, it was a deeply visceral. Like, so now I'm talking about the integration, which happened more in my, my late twenties, um, which was a lot of kind of somatic letting go and just like really bringing the awakening from this consciousness space down into the body so I could live from it in a more sustained way instead of having these two paradigms of like feeling like a self, but then being able to cut through that into the absolute, um, the, the kind of the deep embodied emotional letting go of attachments is what allows it to settle into a more stable abiding in that non-dual awareness. Um, so as you're doing that, yeah, you're letting go of the relative, but I've always, I guess the most when someone's doing like, why would you do this? Why would you go through all, all of the, the suffering of letting go of your attachments, really going into your suffering to process it from, for a lot of people, it's, it's the, the fact of suffering. It's the, like, I'm not having a great time. You know, like there's this play that we're doing, like the mime acting. And for some people it's good enough, but as the Buddha pointed out, it's always quite unsatisfying. You never, it's like a treadmill that never fully pays off. You never, you're, yeah. it's just set up that way. But for some people, it's really not fun. And like, I think I was in that kind of camp where there was enough trauma and stuff where I was just like, this isn't, I didn't make the decision, but my system was just like, nah, like if, if there's another way, we're going the other way. <laughs> we're trying to find a way out of this. Um, so to relieve suffering is a, is a good motivation. But if you just do that, you can very easily get into the deep end of this stuff and just keep going in a way where, um, there's a guy called Jeffrey Martin who's done some studies of people who have this have kind of you know abiding non-dual awareness uh, uh, as their kind of default state, 
um, he talks about people who who go this path who just kind of can become quite callous and just like they just see everything as so perfect that they could be quite mean to people because they're just like I literally have no empathy for your delusional perspective and actually I'm being compassionate because I'm waking you up by my my mere brutal authenticity. <laughs> um, I think a lot of that. So what I'm getting at is that if you just are interested in suffering into, as an individual, that's one path you can go. I think I'm called for the kind of harmony, basically the, the release of suffering that comes with harmony. I think the idea yeah. of living in a harmonious way with reality is what really drives me. So I'm actually would be okay with a bit of suffering if it was a more harmonious way to live. Um, so yeah, I feel I feel called to not turn away from other people and their perspectives and their, and just be like, well, I see from this perspective now, but instead to engage, to try to relieve suffering, um, you know, that's part of the call to speak in public and, uh, yeah, cause the thing that wasn't about bad state and I think it needs all hands on deck to try to, um, to help. And I also think it's with the first example I described, there can be still some delusion operating there because actually if you've genuinely seen there aren't individuals, there's only the one expressing itself, then helping other people to wake up or helping them to relieve their suffering, you are helping to relieve your own suffering. If you walk away and pretend you're an individual, have you really seen the whole game? <laughs> like, have you really seen yeah. that you're not, you know, you're still pretending you're an individual <laughs> if, you, if you don't care. Um, exactly. So yeah, for me it's, and I, I would say, you know, the deconstruction, there's a lot to deconstruct. And so I'm still feeling into this myself in terms of like, um, you know, some people talk about like a soul making Dharma of like how practices to, um, to work in the relative, but, so far, I found it quite straightforward in terms of like, you see through these paradigms and you could look at, you know, uh, your, your partner, you've got a romantic partner, you could look at them, you could say, all right, I used to believe objectively, you are my partner and you are a human being. And like, I used to think that was just the objective facts of the situation. I now see that that was an idea that I was very attached to. And I can, now I can try other ideas. You're a bag of cell, you're a bunch of cells, you know, basically stuck together. You're a bunch of atoms. You're, you're just raw energy that looks like a person through this monkey kind of primate perceptual system. And you go, oh, wait, actually, none of those are actually objectively superior interpretation of what's going on. We just have, as, as, as humans, we all get together and we all have similar brains, similar nervous systems. And we set up this, we go into kind of a conspiracy together where we're like, no, no, you're a person, I'm a person. That's the right interpretation. <laughs> like, don't stray from that. And we have all our mm -hmm. social norms. Um, but at the, so it's, it's very liberating to see through those, to let go of the, the visceral need, because all that is is unconscious reactivity based in past traumas and stuff like that. So if you go through all that and you see all that egoic, sticky, grasping personal stuff, then you're free to actually be a lot more compassionate, a lot more, you have a lot more space for other people, a lot more space to just be this open awareness where someone else arises. And if you're not there, you have all the love to try and help them. Um, so, and, and at the same time, it doesn't help to see my wife as a bunch of atoms. <laughs> like that, that isn't a fun <laughs> story. Like the seeing her as my wife is the best story. Like I like that, that story seems far preferable. So, yeah, so right. naturally there is this engagement with the relative in a, but from a free place. So it feels quite straightforward to me that you just like, don't make it weird, I guess, is my advice. <laughs> like just mm -hmm. kind of, you can, do, you can, you can really wake up deeply and still show up in the world in a pretty normal way. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, um, signal to everyone how awake you are and start behaving in weird ways and saying weird stuff. Like you can just go through the conventional narratives, but without being bound by them basically. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. I think it makes the conventional narrative better. It's a better story. If we're talking about story yeah. here, yeah. out of this emptiness arises compassion is a popular Buddhist saying. Right. And I think that's just natural as well. I think um, with this understanding, it's just natural to be able to see others as yourself and act in that manner. It's just like you said, harmonious, yeah. right? It's harmonious for yourself and the whole. So yeah, yeah it's like, what else am I going to do? Ignore that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's also a kind of a weird thing where you get deep into stuff where there's a dropping away of any judgment about things being better or worse. We spoke about everything being perfect, you know? And so now I think when I first started speaking in public, I thought like it, it would be really good for the world if, I mean, I, on the relative level, I guess I still think if we all focused our energies on scaling awakening and like making the stuff available for people, increasing well-being, like that would be a better <laughs> world. And that would be a, in terms of less suffering. 
But on an individual level, if someone's interested in this stuff, great. But it, if someone is like, no, actually, like, I don't have many traumas and I like, sure, there's a bit of dissatisfaction with the kind of basic way the mind works, but generally I've, I'm having a good life and I'm willing to just live on that level and then die. Like, that's 100% great. Like, I genuinely don't think that's worse, you know, than I don't think it's better to like be awake than to, <laughs> to be yeah. in that mode. Um, Can't force it. Which is really... I guess it almost came as a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know I was holding that some subtle belief there around uh, one path being better than the other. Uh, but yeah, you you just see that perfection and just like yeah, that's that's the right thing for you right now. You know, it's, you know that's that. Exactly. All we can be is an offering, or mm. maybe a testament to this thing. And um, we can't save the world, you know. And nobody likes an evangelical person in any way, right. Right. <laughs> in any form that that takes. No one likes that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, it's definitely natural, I feel, to speak about this stuff. It's effortless. This is why I do it. But I don't try to be forceful and I don't try to pressure right. anybody into it. I definitely think I used to at some point because it is the good news, right? It's the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke okay. about some of the uh, incentives of um, being able to see that you you don't die and that truly we are free. So it's like, I want right. everybody to be able to have that freedom and sense that freedom as I see it, but yeah. you can't, you know, you can't. I mean, I think for me, I, um, that, I, that's why I started being public. I think I had that excitement around wanting to share that. And then it was kind of while I've been doing this stuff that I, I hit the, I wasn't even expecting because I wasn't really following any maps of, of integrating awakening, but suddenly I just hit what's, I think in the progressive insight model, it's called the knowledge of suffering or um, the dark night of the soul in Christian stuff, where it's basically, you just go into like the most visceral, dark, like heavy, you just go into the, the, the heaviest heaviness that you're carrying inside you. And, and so I mentioned grief and stuff and letting that pass through. And when that, that sobered me up out of my evangelical thing where I was like, you know what, like I wouldn't wish this on someone in terms yeah. of like, if they're not, and also it wouldn't work if you need to be walking this path yourself and you need to be mm -hmm. motivated to to push through it um or at least it just needs to hit you over the head like it did with me but if someone yeah. else is being like you should do this like it just won't work um and if they get to that point yeah if they have also if they have any narrative that someone else has said they should do this the ego will, will run right with that and try and blame them and try and come up with narratives to get out of their own <laughs> their own suffering so um yeah it's it feels like there's if you really want to integrate this stuff and live from it there's no free lunch in terms of, like the awakening, the initial seeing of this stuff can feel just like, as I mentioned before, like you just like, oh, I was doing this bondage thing in terms of, uh, <laughs> sounds like some sex thing. I'm doing. <laughs> I was doing this human, <laughs> the bondage of the mind thing as well. I mean. <laughs> the mind thing. And then, um, and then uh, suddenly it falls away and there's just freedom, um, which is true. But then you have to, the integration process, you know, so that kind of comes for free. Um, but I think different people have different integration processes. Like another analogy I've used, I think analogies are often useful in communicating this stuff because uh, it's not conceptual, so it's hard to do any other way. But another analogy I used is like the usual state of the mind is like you're dragging your boat along a road and you, you assume this is normal, but like it doesn't feel right. Like you're scratching at the boat and it's hard, yeah. and, um, but it's manageable, but you're like, surely this isn't it. Surely I'm not supposed to be doing this. And then suddenly you're like teleported to the ocean and you're cruising along in your speedboat and you're like, this is amazing. Like, this mm -hmm. is awesome. Like, this feels right. This is where I'm supposed to be. That's like the awakening. And then the integration is like, all right, now you, you're, you and the boat are teleported back to the road and you've got to drag your boat over the fields and over fences and like get it to the ocean. Yeah. Um, and different people will have their boats at different distances from the ocean. And for me, it was like, it was in the mountains, like really <laughs> far away. <laughs> and it was like a hard slog. Um, but even then I'm still full of absolute gratitude that this happened and that I had to, um, yeah, it's like the awakening carries itself through and there's no option apart from to, to process this stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely sobered me up in terms of like, it's up to everyone if they want to, <laughs> what their own motivations are and like use that as your guiding light. Uh, don't let anyone else tell you what you should be doing. Mm. Well said again. I like that analogy. Once you see the ocean, you can't unsee the ocean, right? Right. It is that, and that's what propels you through the, the difficult journey. I mean, on that journey, you can be like bargaining with yourself and be like, why, why am I doing this now? Like it was actually easier on the road. Now I'm in a ditch with this boat and like, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, uh, but there's that memory of like, you know why you're doing it. You know, you're, get, you're going where you're supposed to be going. And then yeah. the punchline is that you've always been in the ocean dreaming about this journey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the punchline. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. part of the joke. 
that we spoke of before. <laughs> and I've, I mean, not to keep overstretching an analogy, but I've, I was also dwelling on this and thinking about it. It's like when you get to the ocean, the thing you were talking about of engaging with the relative, I feel like the the person who just goes off into their own awakeness is kind of like you push your boat out to sea and then you're just there like looking out under the stars and just like there's there's kind of no narrative there there's, there's just a deepening um versus like do you or do you stay close to the shore like drift out a bit and come back and like help other people who are still yeah. there and so it's like um and i'm still feeling it like i guess what's nice is on the path i used to different people would tell you different things like you know you should definitely go out to sea and just let go of everything. Other people will say, no, no, you should stay close to the shore. And it's it's really, without walking the path yourself, you actually can't assess where those people are speaking from. Like if they're fixated in some way or another, if so, if there's some unconsciousness and, you know. So for me, I guess I got to a point where um, I, I discovered that I was no longer fixated. I no longer needed to know what the final destination is of this journey. The pull towards harmony will lead me where it's going to lead me. If one day I drift off and uh, I drift from the ocean, I'm confident that that will be because that's what feels right, like feels wise in a way that's deeper than words. Whereas right now I'm still in touch with the shore. I'm speaking to you. I'm not you know disappearing in a cave, or whatever. <laughs> so although I do live, do live in the mountains, um, <laughs> but uh, and if that keeps going, that will also that I can imagine that seeming very wise to just be in that ebb and flow of relative and absolute, but without that's often used as a way to bypass doing this deep work of like, if you're trying to deepen the awakening, you can't really deepen it, but if you're trying to integrate it, sometimes people will tell you, oh, you're pushing away your humanity, you're pushing away the relative. And that can often come from a fearfully egoic place, I think, of not wanting to go there themselves into this deeper stuff. Um, so it is an art form, it's a skill, and I think you have yeah. to find people who resonate with you in terms of speaking from these places, of having been there and feeling their authenticity and sincerity and ability to guide you into this into this kind of terrain. Mm -hmm. yeah well said again man, <laughs> Thanks, man. yeah um damn i had a point and i forgot it because i was just <laughs> lost on what you were saying uh oh okay i remember drifting off in the ocean yeah I, dr I drifted off i drifted a little too far <laughs> on that one we spoke about this before we started recording is the importance of intuition and the power of intuition and how you said you were kind of getting into that a little bit and want to uh, elucidate that to people where does intuition come in this? Do you find that it's like a higher intelligence or a different kind of intelligence that you can tap right. into and ride the waves a little easier? Yeah, I think so. The way actually, this is a good segue into some of the material that's going to be in my book as well. So, um, the we live in a culture that really celebrates the rational mind thinking, you know, like ideas, um, and it can give the impression that that's like. The main thing and the intuition and stuff is some add-on separate thing but to me you know if, so if you look at how you know ai right at the moment these these machine learning algorithms that are everywhere now mm -hmm. sure they they're implemented the individual components run on very precise kind of um uh you could say like kind of lo you know logical principles but the what's protocol. happening there yeah but like the algorithm isn't one where you have a kind of a propositional logic where it's like uh, well, rationally, you've got this, and then you've got this. So I deduce this, like that kind of rationality. It's it's far more like intuition, where you have vast amounts of data and patterns are picked out through mm -hmm. the kind of shaping of the um, of the network. So those are modeled on how the brain works, and so how well, we think the brain works. Um, and so I would say that the vast majority of what we do is intuition, um, and then rationality and l language based ideas are this cherry on the cake, where we say like, okay, well, like, I'm going to tell a little story here, but the little story comes after this vast, powerful information processing process that happens through intuition. And if you think of other animals without language, like, you know, a worm isn't using rationality to do all the things it does, or, you know, a bird, it's there guided through this kind of evolutionary sculpting process. Um, so the... I guess, yeah, I think, I think of concepts and, and rationality and all that stuff as actually a very thin veneer on the vast power of, of, of like patterns, I guess you could say. So like, um, the picture I'm kind of laying out in my, in my book is so like with like Darwin's theory of natural selection, he introduced this, this idea that you've got like, uh, animals vary, right? Some giraffes have longer necks, some giraffes have shorter necks. 
and then there's a there's a kind of checking process where the ones with short necks that can't reach the leaves die and so there's like a you could call this a kind of guess and check algorithm where like there's a problem which is how do you get life forms to survive in a certain situation and there's some guess which is they vary and then there's a checking against okay it's the long ones the better ones all right we'll keep those now we'll guess again we'll have a bit more variation and then we'll check again and you know next generation it turns out that algorithm guess and check you know that's what i'm calling it here is it might it might just be that that explains all form basically in the universe um and so uh there's there's a book called darwin does physics which goes into how this can be this can explain kind of quantum mechanics um and the stuff that i'm interested in is the same kind of process explains the brain basically um explains how we survive that we have the same uh algorithm of, of what's called inference where you like you guess what, what's going on in the world and then you check against the evidence from your senses right. so like for a long time based on computers people thought the brain worked like which works the other way you have information you know i'm seeing you in front of me information comes into my eye my eyes like a camera the, the smart rational computer analyzes the information you know of the brain i mean and then you come to some conclusion it's this very linear process and this is saying no no that's it's the other way the brain conjures up a fantasy a hallucination of reality and then it checks it against the senses and that's actually a way more efficient way to do things because moment to moment this room isn't changing very much and so if every if every like frame my brain was like okay process all the pixels process all the pixels process all the pixels like that's a lot of wasted that's a lot of redundancy whereas if i'm just like i'm just going to assume it's going to i'm going to assume it's the same and then if anything changes like if a, a bird flew into the room all i would have to do is update those, you know, I'm saying pixels here, but cells in the retina. So, so this algorithm seems to explain, it seems to be like a general unifying theory of the brain. And so I'm, I'm basically saying that it's actually the life itself, I think is explained by this, this process. And so I'm saying that consciousness is this, the guessing part of this really, that like, in order to be a living thing and to hold yourself together over time, you need to be doing what sometimes people call a controlled hallucination you know, as a uh, metaphor for consciousness. You need to be imagining a world and yourself in it and simulate, you need to basically simulate the world in order to navigate in it. Even if you're a single celled organism, even if you're a worm, all living things can't, it, it was always a, a made up story to think that they could function by reflex where it's like, okay, I sense that, I sense the sugar over here. So now I'm going to turn left and in a very simple, like robotic way. I'm basically saying it's a, it's a made up story that, that any living thing is like a robot. No living things are like robots. We're all these, these emergent kind of um, self-organizing systems that need to be coupled to the world around us. And um, so the, the kind of, from the perspective of neuroscience, it's kind of radical to claim that actually brains didn't bring consciousness into existence, life did. Um, but I'm also like the spiritual part of it as well is worldview is that life forms aren't truly separate from the rest of the world they're like whirlpools in reality so it's really and everything's interconnected so it's like all of reality comes together to to take in itself through us so it's not that life forms are these separate little things that are conscious it's more that you know I've said before that life forms are the eyes with which the universe sees so it's like the universe opens its eyes and sees through us so i'm not a um an idealist or a panpsychist and that i do think consciousness emerged with life i don't think it's there in like atoms or i don't think everything's made of consciousness um i think this fits better with the science but i think it's it's there through all life um and there's also an interesting aspect to this which is that i think this happened because with modern philosophy that around the time of like uh the origins of capitalism and colonialism descartes came up with with this idea basically that the world around us that we want to plunder is unconscious little robots that we can do whatever we want with because you don't you don't have to feel any empathy for it if it if it doesn't have any consciousness it can't suffer so um so why not do what you want with it so i think that was like an emotionally motivated i, don't, I think that was like propaganda basically for um, <laughs> for the new system yeah. and that if you look at two indigenous traditions with like animism and um yeah other other ways of um looking at the world where consciousness is is widespread, I think those are a, a lot more in touch with what's really going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think the modern world is in this delusion of human exceptionalism, human specialness, and we think it's all about the human brain. Um, and obviously in us, the human brain is a crucial part of the loop in shaping our experience, but 
it's really the embodied process of being in touch with the world through the living body that brings consciousness into existence is my, uh, yeah, is my take. So that's yeah. a brief sketch of some of the core stuff in the book. Wow. So are you saying that consciousness is more like a hierarchy? Yeah. So I, I, um, I think that all living things have the same quality of consciousness in the sense that if the lights are on, the lights are on. But I do think there's a difference in kind of richness or like, I think, I definitely don't think that an amoeba is, you know, going to suffer about thinking about how its retirement's going to going to play out. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, it doesn't have a four hundred one k. Yeah, <laughs> but I do. I do think there's probably some. Um, I think if you, if you, so say you gradually increase the salt level in one area of its dish and it moves away from it because if it gets too high, it's going to its membrane is going to you know be disrupted. I think that like uh, move away from that is is much like our feeling of like thirst or some, something unpleasant that's like oh I don't want I don't want that. I think mm. it makes sense to think of if you don't think that you kind of have to explain how consciousness is something different to your embodied process of of being alive. Um yeah. And so I think it makes it's more harmonious to assume that the one thing I'm not fixed on, I mean, maybe it's more than one thing, but yeah, is this kind of question of um I guess you could say levels of consciousness. I don't go into that that much. Um, and it could be what I say in the book is that it's possible that they have very minimal experience. Let's say a plant or something has like very minimal experience. But the catch there is that I think the fact of awareness of like the lights being on, what could be called like a non dual pure consciousness, like. I don't think that can go away. So they would effectively be enlightened. <laughs> so like if you <laughs> yeah. wanna if you wanna feel superior to them, uh like amoebas are functioning as such a like in a flow state, like a like or, or a cessation in meditation where you're so everything's going so smoothly that you actually don't need much of an experience. But there's still this kind of blazing light of awareness, you could say. It's like um so yeah, like it's almost like if we're if we're more complex and, and impressive in some way, it's because we've come up with these minds that allow us to suffer in, in very rich, detailed <laughs> narratives. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there's there's there there is a literally about I think it was yesterday or the day before, um a friend and colleague, um Shimil Chandaria published a theory of consciousness um with a, another great scientist called uh, Ruben Lacone and and they their stuff complements my stuff. They're talking about brains, but so they're not talking about where it emerged. But they talk about levels of consciousness as a kind of like. Um, so I'm saying like living things simulate the world, um, or simulate reality and themselves in it. There's and they're adding this thing, which is that um, in the brain, that simulation is fed back into itself as if it's like another sense. So like I can sense vision, I can sense hearing, I can sense, um, yeah, all my different senses. But they're saying. You can also have meta awareness. You can sense the fact that you're aware. Like the model knows itself. So they're yeah. kind of saying, like, and that with meditation and psychedelics, that you 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 amp up that recursive meta awareness. Um, so they're they're offering a way of thinking about levels of awareness, which I think should pair might pair quite nicely with what I'm offering because I'm just trying mm -hmm. to get to this thing of like where did it come into existence? Um, so yeah, their their theory is very cool. It's called a beautiful loop. This paper that just came out, um, I recommend. Uh, mm. That's yeah. pretty powerful. I think that's probably what makes our intelligence a little bit different than the amoeba or a tree is we have this ability to loop the I am that I amness. Yeah, they do think that feeds into intelligence as well. Um, yeah, the authors of the paper. Um, yeah. And this probably has crossed your mind. I know it crosses my mind. If it is a sort of hierarchical form, are we at the top of the ladder? You know, are we at the top of this thing? I don't think so. This, and I'm not talking about aliens, you know, I'm not talking about gods or anything. But to me, my intuitive sense tells me that somehow, some way, we're not at the top if this is some kind yeah. of hierarchy and that evolution is still going on in some way. There is, so the, the picture of the selection algorithm I mentioned before of, of the kind of guess and check thing, that is like a... Um, a hierarchical or like a fractal nested thing where it's playing out through evolution it's playing out through our individual lives as we learn and through our consciousness um it's playing out in our individual cells and maybe in the level of physics um and so if if that's why we are conscious because we're doing that kind of knowing reality um i guess it does open the door to like 
is the process of evolution like some amorphous fluid river of consciousness of like experience um is that or does that go along with the forms that we see my speculation is no that it feels like to what we call consciousness is having a perspective and so it feels like for us we're like an organized whole um there's a theory called integration information theory that captures this nicely so i think that might be a prerequisite to have a perspective on the world but it's not impossible that there are dynamics in the universe that are and this takes you more into kind of panpsychism a more kind of enchanted view of the whole cosmos where who knows if if uh there are patterns that are associated with consciousness. Uh, and I don't know if we ever will know. Um, it's fun to think about. <laughs> it's fun to think about for sure. Yeah. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. We're just having some fun here. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like there is uh, some essence of novelty that is built upon this hierarchy of consciousness, this hierarchy of intelligence. Um, a better story, you could say, right? We're living a better story than the amoeba would maybe i mean maybe i'm a little biased that's interesting no no that's interesting i mean i so I, yeah i mean i think the um i don't think there is a story there really with the amoeba yeah, i think they don't have the cognitive machinery to live in narratives beyond desire for food avoidance of pain um yeah. or maybe maybe slightly more complex i don't know uh, i haven't studied amoebas closely but um <laughs> I don't know if many people have really in terms of these cognitive <laughs> capacities, but there are interesting studies showing they are intelligent. They do have the basic kind of components of intelligence, mm -hmm. um, but that's more a learning stuff. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's like like you said that we're just having some fun here. I think the the thing is is that we are living fantastical like the, the ability of the human mind to conjure narratives and to to alter the world through them is insane. Like I mentioned Descartes yeah. as kind of like propaganda for the system. I mean, the system has taken hold, I think without people like Descartes convincing other people who had the, the hands on the steering wheel of, of the world at that point that, um, that this was the way to think about things. I think if instead you had someone saying you need to have compassion for all these creatures that you're killing um, and people and humans that you're dehumanizing and stuff, I, I suspect, I think humans need some narrative to guide their the way they act. I think there is some causal power there. Um, but yeah, I think generally the narratives are bondage and that they are why we suffer. And it's that that is the dream is is um or the nightmare you know, that we suffer in is is when we we reify those narratives and think they're real. Um and then we can't get out of them like the mime in the box. Uh but like we said before, like maybe the the optimal thing, because we still need them. We I don't think everyone should disappear into the ocean, you know. Um mm -hmm that analogy I'm really dotting across with the analogies here but um <laughs> but yeah so i think a world in which we know that ideas are ideas and the stories are stories but we can entertain more beautiful ones is is yeah is a better yeah, world exactly. and um yeah yeah it's a good way to put it as the show goes on right yeah stories are still being written even if we recognize it's a story and uh yeah that's the important part of this whole path this pathless path is uh yeah. It doesn't end, right? There's no ending, right? It's right, um, right, right. It's different. They hold a little less weight. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The um yeah, you just sparked a thought there, which is that the um I think I mentioned early on that I feel like the solution I hit on is informed by this kind of the awakening perspective. Um it might be interesting to explain what it is because it, you know, as a scientist it can sound like I'm uh I guess I, what I want to convey is I'm not coming from some naive, like materialist viewpoint where I just think the world is made of solid stuff. So I, I think the, whilst I'm not an idealist, I, I, I you know, I guess you could say I'm, I'm an immaterialist in the sense that um, I think the the crucial insights from the kind of spiritual perspective that will allow people to kind of cut through some of the the, the issues that are that plague people who are trying to figure out consciousness. One of the key ones is the oppression of substance like you know we have this these ideas these narratives the stories that we live in a substantial solid environment and that we're something solid and stable like you know when i mentioned like the essence of weed we feel like there's a there is something in the the plant um or that there's something inside me something solid and stable and then with on the spiritual path you see through that and you see actually everything's kind of groundless and empty um and so i, I think that's that can lead you to instead of what's called a substance metaphysics, where you think the world is made out of genuinely solid little building blocks like atoms, it leads to this view of, oh, actually maybe reality is an interdependent flow of, of occurrences, events, you know, happenings yeah. rather than solid stuff. And I think that's the right way to think about it. Mm. 
and so I, I I start I think I give a picture of like what I think is going on in a way that I think it fits with science and spirituality. And the way I do that is to say, well, you got to if you want a truly naturalistic picture, you could just say, okay, there's a god, or okay, there's a cosmic consciousness, but that isn't really explaining it. So I think to really explain it, you've got to start with nothing. And so I say, well, what's the what's the nature of absolute true nothing? Well, there can't be any boundaries or limits because that would be a thing. Like you have to explain why that thing exists. So true nothingness is synonymous with boundlessness, and which is kind of infinite. Yeah, just like no limits. Um, and if there's anything we know about infinity, it's that anything that can happen will happen within infinity. So I think that's basically where we find ourselves. I think that's what's going on is we are in true nothingness and within true nothingness, the, the web of, um, of interdependent fluctuations, events that make up physics, that make up us. Like, I think that like Indra's net in, you know, how they call it in Hinduism or is it Buddhism? Um, that I think that's what form is, is like this ever, this impermanent flux of stuff coming into existence and going out of existence, merely because it can, because there was some potential in the space of infinity. Um, and so it's a bit like the snake that eats its own tail, the Ouroboros, the, where it's like, there is only boundlessness, there is only freedom, limitlessness. And within that, there's this expressiveness that pours over itself but there's nothing else for it. So it's always going out, but there's nothing else for it to pour into. So it's always returning to itself as well. Um, and that's all that's happening. And everything that else we think is happening is an interpretation that arises within that. And, you know, I've, there are patterns that there are life forms and there's all that stuff. But like, like I said earlier, where it's like, are there humans or are there atoms or are there energy, you know, patterns of energy? Those are all interpretations. There is this process, but what we call bodies and minds and stuff come up with these these uh yeah these boxing in of, of of rigid ideas that we think is how reality really is but so when you awake when you wake up you just discover, you discover that boundlessness of reality eating itself um, in a way that just feels like love it just feels like a radically open allowing um which i think you know i think maybe our feeling of love is scaffolded on top of this more metaphysically deep limitless boundless unconditionality that is what everything is um i think it's also why when you on the spiritual path you you deepen into kind of emptiness and you, you find that there really isn't anything there isn't some solids there isn't some you know the, it's the groundless ground right there is no you are deepening into something more fundamental than your ideas but it's not something solid it's not something substantial um so that's the kind of the bit of the book where i'm like marrying science and spirituality mm -hmm. yeah where they get married is love <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> that's great <laughs> kind of play on words right there right yeah. yeah that's um quite poetic it feels like love truly and i think that's what the story is about if we're talking about narrative and story and something and nothing and where it all comes together it's some kind of cohesive experience of love in some way right. and that's really all we can explain it with <laughs> It's love, man. That, I mean, that that takes us back into the relative of how you marry the absolute and the relative is just be be led by love, I think is is a wise yeah. thing to Yeah, to think so. Like if you're if you if you feel if you feel you're deeply awakened and that actually someone isn't and you want to be callous to them, like is that are you really just being authentic with yourself? Are you being led by love in that moment? Maybe you are. Maybe you think you're gonna help wake them up and you know, but just being holding yourself accountable, being authentic to that deepest urge of the compassion as you mentioned that arises out of emptiness. Um and I think for people, you know, I'm always aware I'm not preaching to the choir with this stuff in terms of speaking to spiritual people. I'm also speaking to scientifically minded people. And I think the the love thing is where it feels too good to be true because that like yeah. Unending love is what, who wouldn't want that? Um, but we think of a love as like an emotion alongside other emotions on the shelf of like feelings. But it, it just seems to turn out if you, if, and other people agree that if you look into this stuff in your own experience, it doesn't, it's like loves the context in which everything arises. It's like, uh, and anything can be held in love. It's, and the we're, love is just a word that points to this, this quality of openness that I think is absolutely fundamental to reality. Um, and actually, interestingly, like the, the guess and check algorithm thing I was mentioning, it was like, you could say it's like, it's because of the fact of, of the, the complete openness with like evolution that like anything can happen and, and death can happen, 
that like you get this looping back that means that forms start to get sculpted and you, instead of having radical openness you actually get specific things emerging like giraffes with long necks as opposed to short necks mm -hmm. so i think it's like this algorithm this statistical like pattern is like the radical openness of reality is so open that it feeds back on itself and starts to trim itself down in places and create order and structure and people like seeming people with minds that can limit things and so it's like reality is like this huge yes that is so it's such a huge yes that it can even say no <laughs> because it manages to like loop back in a way that creates or it seems to say no even though it's all happening in the yes um, <laughs> i don't know if that makes any sense but uh, that's how i say it <laughs> i got you it's all happening in the yes but um how would you know how wonderful the yes is without the no how would you know <laughs> think about that that's another play on words yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow um this is powerful stuff man that's some yin and yang right there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i wish that symbol hadn't been i feel like it the, most people see it now is just as the quintessential new age thing and like kind of cringe at it but it's such a powerful elegant symbol like i yeah the, i do think that is effectively what's happening in reality is yeah it's the polarization of opposites the du the the oneness that births duality like i think taoism is if go yeah you know, if people haven't read the Tao Te Ching, go read it it's uh it's all in there Mm -hmm. not all yeah. of it but, but a lot of it's in there <laughs> a lot of it's in there oh. hey at the end of the day it's all just different fingers pointing at the moon whether it's Taoism or mm. neuroscience right, right, or right. this podcast or the bible it's all just yeah, yeah. other stories for us trying to point the way to this magnificence and majesty of the yes yeah and that was a funny thing for me um coming from my my path beginning with the so you know when you talk about christianity most people i think might think of the thing that caused me to suffer which was the institutionalized structures of power that you know i mean i was, I was going to say effectively abusing children with that meant on an emotional level as what happened to me but we know that's also actually happening on a physical yeah. level as well that's so like all of story. this yeah like so there's all that like so when you talk about christianity people often think like that's what you're talking about but then on this path you know you mentioned like this is the good news and um a few things you said like jesus quotes came to mind and it's you know to discover there's this term uh like a jesusist like someone who follows like jesus as a spiritual teacher rather than like as like a mm. necessarily a supernatural figure or like in the church of christianity and um yeah and i think it's really funny to have it's almost like the mystical core of religions feels like i guess the way i think about it is we all have this light inside us of this like you know being in touch with reality and it's it is the thing everyone wants and so you get you get these geniuses who come along you express it well and then in the relative that creates power because everyone wants that so suddenly everyone's gathering around and talking about jesus and then the the, the people who want to exploit that come in and then i feel like that's like an eternal process of, of like the fresh birthing of, of insight into the stuff and then it becomes corrupted and then you need a fresh birthing um but it's it's interesting to have come from the corrupt to decide to see and think that's what this whole thing's about to, to discover the beautiful core of it um yeah. and come around yeah yeah i do think in their pure form all religions and belief systems are speaking on the unspeakable what we're trying yeah. to speak on here but they're all in their pure form non-dogmatic form i think right point in the way effectively if you know how to look at it in the right way that's a great um I think it's in the Gospel of Thomas in one of the non-canonical gospels, the you know, sayings of Jesus that are thought to be older than the um yeah, you know, the canonical gospels. Uh there's a thing where he says, uh it's like first you will be amazed, then you then you will be like distressed uh, or disturbed, and then you will reign over the all or, or something. And um so I got like it's it's loosely like that. And uh but that put really the quote catches on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> that really captures my um experience of this path i think he's talking about this exact path you know this this i mean you're looking at, even in the canonical gospels it says the kingdom of god is within you he's literally pointing <laughs> towards this direct he's and he and in the non-canonical ones he says stuff like if um if heaven's in the sky the birds will be you there if it's in the sea the fish will be you there like of course of course it's not like a place you go to <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's you know and he says like it's all around you it's within you and without you so it's very clear non-dual pointing um but obviously that's too empowering to people so that well, be got out got stripped out when the romans got hold of it yeah anyway, that's another thing mm -hmm. yeah that's definitely another thing um it's in there though if you know how to look at it with a keen eye 
you'll be able to see, especially in the Gospel of Thomas, for sure. I recommend that. Yeah. Before you read the Bible, read the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <sighs> well, hey, man, we can put out all the pointers we want. Um, we might be exhausting it at this point. We could, <laughs> you know, there's pretty much an infinite amount of pointers. You could say everything is a pointer, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> in one way right. or the other. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't have anything else to say or ask. I think uh, we've said everything we needed to say. But do you have anything else you want to leave us on? No, that was great. I feel like I, uh, I've given you plenty of mixed metaphors and stuff. I'm not going to try and bring out <laughs> new analogies at the end here. So I'll, I'll just I'll leave it at I that. Like the yeah, thank you. Though. This has been great. For Thanks. sure. For sure. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. I think this is one of the best talks that I've done. And I'm not just saying this um, just because you're here talking to me. This is um, This is pretty profound. And you have a way Thanks. with words. And I wish you all the best, man. Keep doing your thing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think if... Um, this seems to come from a deep sincerity, like a deep desire to communicate, like to have that, you know, like a desire for, yeah, helping move towards clarity and relief of suffering. And um, so I think, I think that's where the effort comes from to get to hone this and make it come out the right way. Uh, so it's nice to hear that it's, that it's working to some extent. It's working for me. I don't know about everybody else, but <laughs> it worked for me for this yeah. past hour. But yeah, I appreciate you, Dr. James. Wish you all the best, and uh, yeah, I wish the audience all the best as well. Peace and love to you, and peace and love to the audience. Same here. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.